This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I'm really honored to be here. I'm honored that all of you came out tonight despite the uh, swine flu epidemic. Uh, well, well, we, we, we won't try to shake hands too much today. Uh, I want to thank uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, arts and lectures here, critical issues here, the Center for Work, Labor, and Democracy. I'd like to thank, and I'd like to thank in particular, uh, Nelson Lichtenstein, who's been extremely helpful to me o over the years, and he returns my phone calls because he knows I ask softball questions. It's truly uh, a time of crisis for the nation's workers. The job losses for the, for the last few months have been staggering. 663,000 jobs lost in March, 651,000 jobs lost in February, and the last five months we've lost more than three million jobs, since the recession began more than five million jobs. As I often tell people, it's a very good time to be in college and out of the job market. So I congratulate you for being in college right now. Overall, there are third, more than 13 million Americans unemployed. Uh, the unemployment rate for blue collar workers, factory workers is a frightening 15.3%. For African Americans, it's 13.3%. For teenagers, 21.7%, one in five. For African-American teenagers in many cities, it's nearly 50%. And for generally Americans aged 20 to 24, and I think there are many uh, of that age in this room, uh, for Americans aged 20 to 24, the unemployment rate is 14%. This is really bad stuff, and let's hope that things get better soon. I think we should all pray that President Obama's stimulus package works because we as a nation can't afford to have more such staggering months of job losses. I fear for the nation if the stimulus program flops. As for those critics who deride Obama's stimulus program as just more profligate, extravagant spending, I wonder whether those critics would have also denounced John Maynard Keynes's pump priming policies that helped end the Depression, uh, whether they would have denounced Keynes for, profligate, for urging profligate spending. Many people, uh, many analysts, many folks in Washington act as, a, as if uh, things were just peachy for American workers before the economic downturn began in December of 2007. We always heard you know, how well Wall Street was doing, how well the stock market was doing, how well consumers were doing. But uh, I really beg to differ. I think before, even before this recession started, things were really quite tough for the nation's workers. And uh, I, I, the reason I wrote this book was I felt that uh, even though the nation's economy in theory was doing well, even though uh, corporate profits were rising by 13% a year, even though the economy was growing pretty well, even though employee productivity uh, was rising strongly, for the typical worker, things were getting worse by many, me many, me many, many measures. And perhaps it was presumptuous of me, perhaps it was arrogant of me, but I thought uh, someone, me, should try to write a book, you know, that really would explain to the nation's policymakers, to the nation's uh, news media, that things are really bad for the typical worker. I guess I was in ways, you know, perplexed, even appalled, that there was this huge squeeze the nation's workers faced on wages being stagnant and health benefits getting worse and pension benefits getting worse and, and people f uh, facing more stress on the job, and there was this... Uh, big squeeze and uh, you know it hardly got any any attention in Washington or in the nation's news media you know, sometimes people ask me my book came out uh, a year ago April 
and a lot of uh, bad things have happened in the economy since. And people ask me, what would you have changed in your book if you were writing it now? And I said I would have renamed it the humongous squeeze rather than the big squeeze. Uh, Nelson, uh, Professor Lichtenstein very generously uh, cited, you know, compared my book to Studs Terkel's Working and Barbara Ehrenreich's Nickel and Dimed, and those are both marvelous, marvelous books, and I felt that my book, you know, in ways builds on them, uh, and, and I tried to do something different. I really tried in this book to do kind of an across-the-board view of what's happening in the American workplace, and I write about, uh, you know, white-collar workers whose jobs are sent to India, I write about blue-collar workers whose factories are shut down in the Midwest. I write about you know, temp workers, some of whom temp for five and ten years as temps. Uh, I write about uh, undocumented uh, Hispanic immigrants who get exploited in, in many, many different ways. I write about uh, workers in their 60s and 70s who hope to retire, but they discover that they don't have enough money in their 401k plans to retire, and I write a lot about young workers and the huge challenges they face and how, in many ways, things might be harder for you know, the, the so-called 20-something uh, you know, 20, 20 generation than for their parents' generation, and I'll return to that at, at length in a few minutes. I must confess that in ways I misnamed my book. I call it The Big Squeeze, but in ways it should have been called The Big Squeezes because the nation's workers are squeezed in so many ways. Uh, when I was first working on the book, uh, I was having lunch with a friend from the New York Times, Samini Sengupta, who's in our new Delhi bureau now, and she said, Steve, you know what, you should really call your book, uh, you should call it Screwed at Work. And I said, Samini, I'm a very inhibited New York Times reporter, I dare not use such a racy, a racy title. So when I say there are several squeezes, uh, you know, the first squeeze, I, I, I think, is, is really kind of an overarching thing for the nation's workers, is the economic squeeze. And that takes many, many insidious forms. One is there's a terrible wage squeeze. You know, for the nation's workers this decade, uh, wages after inflation have hardly budged. And, and that has come a time, and here I'm talking um, even before this recession, uh, well, before this recession, uh, there was another recession in 2001, and that recession ended in November 2001, then we had six good years of economic growth from the end of 2001 through the end of 2007. And during that time, corporate profits more than doubled, productivity per worker rose 17%, which is a nice healthy number, yet, as I said, wages for the typical worker uh, rose just seven-tenths of one percent, virtually nothing. So that shows that you know, something is really out of balance, out of kilter, that there's economic growth, Corporate profits are doing well, employees are contributing more in the form of increased productivity, yet uh, that increased prosperity was not really shared with workers. You know, there's something very unusual that happened in this economic recovery from 2001 to, to late 2007 that many people don't understand. Uh, many economists say that for the first time in American history during an economic recovery, median household income actually declined. So that's startling to think about, that for the, for the typical family, median income fell by uh, 2% uh, during that so-called economic recovery. And in theory, during an economic recovery, things are supposed to get better for everyone so that when the next recession comes, people are in better shape. But actually, at the end of this economic recovery, people were in worse shape uh, ec uh, than, than at the beginning of the recovery. Another part of this economic squeeze is what's been happening with health insurance. Again, we had this economic recovery in theory when things are getting better, uh, there should be fewer and fewer Americans without health insurance. Yet, during this period of expansion, uh, eight million Americans found themselves without health insurance. So we as a nation now have nearly 50 million people without health insurance, which is basically one in six Americans. So here we are, the world's richest nation, right? And, and yet we have one in six people without health insurance. We're the on only advanced industrialized nation that doesn't have universal health coverage. Even for people who, who have health coverage, uh, they're also very much feeling the squeeze. The typical worker is paying twice as much out of pocket in premiums, $1,700 more out of pocket in premiums than was the case seven years ago. So even though wages have been flat, 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 
people have to fork over more each, each, uh, each year for health premiums. Another part of the squeeze is what's happened to the retirement security system, as they call it. I actually have come to think that's really an oxymoron. It should really be called the retirement insecurity system. As those of you who are old enough to have 401ks and were saving for retirement, you know, many of us have seen our 401ks fall, fall by 40, 50, 60 percent. And many of you have heard the joke that our 401ks have become 101ks. Um, the, uh, uh, according to the Congressional Research Service, the typical worker aged 55 to 64 has just $40,000 in his or her 401k. So imagine retiring at age 63 with just $40,000 in your 401k. You have $18,000 a year from Social Security and maybe you could take a few thousand out of your 401k, but if you're going to live another 20 or 30 years, yeah, you don't gonna, you're not going to have enough money to really retire satisfactorily. And I've written some stories recently about um, people in their 60s, people in their early 60s who are thinking of retiring in a year or two, and they've seen what, they saw what happened to the 401k, and now they're saying, oh, shucks, I got to work until my 70s. In my book, I write about a gentleman named Harold Danley, who spent 30 years working for an insurance company in, in Minnesota. At age 67, he had bypass surgery. He thought, okay, now I could finally retire. So then there he was at age 73. He discovers his 401k doesn't have enough money. So at the age of 73, Harold Danley is working two part-time jobs as a, secu as a security guard. So uh, in many ways, our retirement security system is seriously broken. And I think uh, that's something we as a nation should, should uh, really look at. Allow me one, one more statistic. I'm now I'm throwing... I know I'm throwing too many statistics at you. In 1980, 84 percent. In, in, in 1980, in companies with more than 100 workers, 84 percent of the workers had traditional retirement plans. My parents, my father was a, a teacher, my mother's a social worker. They're both in their 80s, and they're living very nicely on the monthly pensions they get. For people. Uh, now, nowadays, at companies with more than 100 workers, only one in three workers have those typical pensions of old. Those have been replaced increasingly with 401ks. And as I said, 401ks are not nearly as generous, not nearly as uh, certain for, for providing for people's, um, for people's uh, retirement security. Another part of the squeeze is what's happening uh, to, to folks in poverty. Again, we had this economic recovery from 2001 to 2007, yet uh, the number of people in poverty rose by 6 million. And again, that shouldn't be happening. During a time of prosperity, things should be getting better for those at the bottom, but things really got, you know, have gotten worse. So now one in, eight, one in eight Americans lives below the poverty line, and the poverty line is what, 22,000, 22, believe it or not, for a family of four. Imagine trying to live on, on 22,000 if you have a family, if you have a household of four. And another thing that, that uh, I think is a disgrace is that in the United States, one in five children under age 18 lives in poverty. And I, I, I guess I find that uh, somewhat mind boggling. I, uh, in the introduction to my book, I write about a worker who's struggling to get out of get out of uh, poverty. And, and allow me just to read two paragraphs uh, from the book. Over the years, I've interviewed thousands of workers, steel workers and strawberry pickers, Microsoft whizzes and minimum wage waitresses. And a handful of their faces and tails stick most vividly in my mind. One worker whose story nags at me in particular is Michael Johnson, a father of five who has worked for 17 years as a security guard in downtown Los Angeles. Johnson is an engaging, earnest man who has come a long way from his days as a drug addict. Now he wants nothing more than to be a good father and to provide his five children with what they need to thrive. He is proud that his three oldest sing in the youth choir at Victory Baptist Church, yet he wishes that he could afford dance lessons and piano lessons for them. When I first met Johnson in the summer of 2006, his big problem was that his security job He's the post commander in the main lobby of a downtown office tower. Uh, paid him just $10 an hour. 
On that salary, about all Johnson can afford is his $975 monthly rent and food for his family. To pay for everything else, utilities, gasoline, car repairs, payments on his 1998 Nissan Quest, clothes for the kids, and furnishings for the gloomy two-bedroom apartment, Johnson took a second full-time job guarding a construction site in LA's northern suburbs. His wife, Denisha, can't work because she hurt her back badly while lifting a 270-pound patient when she was a nursing home aide. One of Johnson's many frustrations is that when he took his second job, the state of California kicked his family off food stamps. He was told he earns too much. Each morning, Johnson gets up at 5.20 and leaves for work at 6.15 before his children wake up. After putting in eight hours at one job and seven at the other, he returns home just before 11 at night after his children have gone to sleep. I'm missing them grow up, he says. I can't do this forever. Johnson's the only worker I, I really wrote about in my introduction because I think his story captures how for people who are working their derrieres off, who are trying to do the right thing, there's still this huge squeeze. Here's someone who worked all these years and was still making just $10 an hour and, and you know, had to work two jobs and, and, and uh, could hardly see the kids he loved, the kids he was you know, busting his butt for you know, so that they could have a decent life. He didn't even get to see them. So um, I was talking about the economic squeeze. I just want to uh, mention a few other aspects of that squeeze. Now, I guess a few years ago I was astounded that the nation was losing so, so many manufacturing jobs and it wasn't even part of the nation's discussion. And this decade alone, the United States of America has lost nearly 30% of its manufacturing jobs. And perhaps I'm old-fashioned, but I think manufacturing is important for creating wealth and, and assuring a nation's prosperity. And manufacturing also provides many good middle-class jobs with good wages and good benefits uh, that are really key, especially for people who don't have the privilege of going to college, for people who come out of high school and want a good job. So in this decade alone, the number of manufacturing jobs has dropped by 5 million from 17.3 million to 12.3 million. And I think that's another often unheralded aspect of, of this terrible squeeze that we as a nation are facing. Another aspect of the squeeze is, I call the time squeeze. And I think partly because the wages of so many workers have been flat, have been stagnant, workers are working more and more hours to try to make ends meet. And the typical American worker works 1,800 hours a year. Um, that is 135 hours, about three and a half full-time weeks more than the typical British worker. That's 240 hours six full-time weeks more than the typical French worker, and that's 370 hours, nine and a quarter full-time weeks more than the typical German worker. So we Americans work very, very hard. Uh, the typical middle-class couple in the United States, again, trying to make ends meet, uh, works 540 hours more. Husband and wife together work 540 hours more than was the case a generation earlier. So I think husbands and wives are spending more time in the office, more time in the factory, more time in their jobs, and that translates to less time with their kids and often less time with each other. Uh, many of you in your college courses, I'm sure, are studying various aspects of American exceptionalism. I said before, we're the only industrialized nation without universal health coverage. We're also the only industrialized nation that doesn't require paid vacation for every worker. In the 27 nations of the European Union, Everyone is guaranteed at least four weeks vacation. In Germany and France, most workers are entitled to at least five or six weeks vacation. Here in the United States, the average worker takes 10 days vacation. I've interviewed many workers who say, uh, low-wage workers especially, I've worked five, six, seven years in my job. I've never been allowed a week vacation. Um, that's another part of the squeeze. We're also the only advanced industrialized nation that doesn't have paid sick days for workers. Um, I write about a, a Dominican immigrant who was working at a dollar store in Brooklyn, Julia Ortiz, and uh, she said that many of her co-workers would stay home a day or two when their kids got sick. They wanted to take care of their kids, be good, be good mothers, and they get fired for taking a day or two off uh, for caring for their kids. In many other countries, that would be illegal uh, because they have family-friendly laws to allow uh, 
mothers and fathers to take a day or two off if their kids are sick. A last part of American exceptionalism, we're only one of four countries in the world that doesn't have paid maternity leave. And we're in very good company here. We're with Liberia, Swaziland, and Papua New Guinea. I often wonder, you know, uh, how it came to pass that, you know, so many of the other you know, industrial na nations have adopted policies that are much more worker-friendly and family-friendly than in the United States. I know in the United States when anyone says we should have paid maternity leave, uh, millions of companies rise up and say, we have enough employer mandates, you know, we'll be forced out of business, we'll become uncompetitive as a nation if we allow another employer mandate like paid vacation or paid sick days. Another uh, important aspect of the squeeze uh, that's been written a lot about lately uh, as Wall Street has you know, fallen into crisis is uh, we have huge income inequality in the nation. Um, according to the Congressional Budget Office, from between 1979 and 2006, for the middle fifth of Americans, income rose 21% after inflation. 21% and that's mainly because the wife in the household was working more hours. Uh, for the bottom fifth of Americans, uh, after inflation, income rose only 11%. So 11% for the bottom and 21% for the middle. For the top fifth of Americans, uh, median income rose 87%. And for the top 1%, median income rose 256%. It more than tripled. So something seems awry that the middle class, uh, their income is rising, you know, percentage-wise, you know, one-tenth as fast. Far, far, far more slowly than, than for, for the wealthiest. Uh, and for CEOs, back in 1976, the nation's CEOs earned 36 times what the average worker earned. Nowadays, the typical CEO earns 370 times as much as the typical worker. And I'm often worried that when I say things like this, people are going to jump on me and say, you support class warfare. You're criticizing you know, wealthy Americans who you know, are doing so much to, to build up this nation. Um, I love this quote, and I ask people to guess who said it. Uh, was it Ralph Nader, was it John Edwards, or was it Jesse Jackson? So the quote is, the average American went exactly nowhere on the economic scale since 1980. He's been on a treadmill while the super rich have been on a spaceship. Who said this? Warren Buffett said this. Not quite a, 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 uh, a Ralph Nader, and he's what, the nation's second wealthiest man now. Uh, uh, they called him, uh, you know, the, the, what, the, the, the Wizard of Omaha. Um, Buffett also said something interesting. He said, there's class warfare all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's making war and we're winning. Uh, Larry Summers, you know, who, who's now the top economic aide to President Obama, former uh, Treasury Secretary, former President of, of Harvard. I know a lot of people say that, that Larry Summers is very conservative. So Summers had something very interesting to say a, a few months back. He said that if the level of income inequality had remained the same as it was in 1980, that the bottom 80% of American families would be earning $670 billion, B billion dollars more a year, which translates to it like $8,000 more per family. So if the typical family earns $50,000, $60,000 can be the difference between foreclosure, between the difference between having your car repossessed. So uh, I, 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 I uh, thought Summers shed some important light uh, on, on, on rising uh, income inequality. Um, quickly, two other aspects of this quiz. Again, because income for so many households was stagnant, many, many people felt they wanted you know, to live better, so they borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. Uh, I think part of it was keeping up with the Joneses, part of it was that people wanted that SUV and that flat screen TV, so they borrowed. Uh, so much so that for the typical American household, debt levels went to 130% of annual income, which was a record level. And in 2005, for the first time since the Great Depression, uh, Americans actually spent more money than they earned. The net savings rate went below zero, which is extremely healthy. And I think one of the reasons we as a nation find ourselves in this 
humongous economic mess is that we went so much into hock. We had this terrible trade deficit, this terrible budget deficit, and Americans borrowed so much to buy homes, you know, they, they maxed out on their credit cards, that once the economy started to weaken, once housing prices started to fall, once Americans could no longer use their houses as ATMs to take money out of, this whole house of cards, I think the president might have called it this whole pile of sand, started to collapse. And now we find ourselves as a nation um, in, this, in these terrible economic straits. And I often think that you know, if income for the typical workers were going up healthily, and I think that could have happened if companies did more to share the prosperity and if there were less income inequality, if incomes for the typical American were going up faster, then we might not have so many people borrowing and borrowing way too much, and that might have helped avoid the uh, terrible economic situation we're in. Our last part of this economic squeeze I want to focus on is what's happening to the nation's young workers. And I think a lot of people between the ages of 16 and, 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 and 30 really don't understand how tough things are. I, I don't mean to be discouraging, but this is a really uh, tough situation, and uh, I, I, you know, I sometimes wonder that, you know, that, you know, the, the, you know, the under 30 generation should try to figure out what can be done to make life easier for their generation. Why do I say things are so tough? Uh, there was a study commissioned by Pew Charitable Trust that found for men in their 30s nowadays, they, their median income is 12% less than their fathers were, than their fathers earned, 12% less after inflation than their fathers earned when their fathers were 30 a generation ago. So someone who's 30 now is making 12% less after inflation than his father was. The story, was only, the, the story was only about men, not about women. Don't accuse me of sexism, please. And, and in the report, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust wrote, there has been no progress at all for the younger generation. The up escalator has historically ensured that each generation would do better than the last, than the last. That may not be working very well. In my book, I write about a 29-year-old worker at, at the great company Caterpillar Tractor. And uh, unfortunately for him, uh, there's a two-tier wage contract, so the newer workers will forever be earning less, never be able to earn as much as the older workers with more seniority. You know, I, I focus on uh, a worker named John Arnold. The most he can ever earn at the factory is $14.90 an hour, and people who are hired before him have a much higher pay scale, scale and can earn, in theory, 20 or $22 an hour. And I think that's a good but unfortunate gauge about how things have, in many ways, got, gotten tougher for, for younger workers. Um, One-fourth of workers uh, under age 30 do not have health insurance from any source. That's the highest of, of workers in any category. When, when uh, my generation, when, when kids out of high school my age found their first job, their entry-level job, um, when they were in their, in their 20s, two-thirds of those jobs provided health insurance. Now, someone fresh out of high school looking for a job, only one-third of those jobs will provide health insurance. Again, for workers under age 34, only 42% of them uh, are in any retirement plan at all. And uh, in my book, I, I quote a, a, a Professor Sheldon Danziger from the University of, of, uh, of Michigan. He says that in the 1960s and 1970s, when he graduated from high school, you saw high school graduates getting good jobs at Ford and AT&T, jobs that in inflation-adjusted terms were paying 20 or $25 in today's wages. Nowadays, most kids with just high school degrees will work in service sector jobs for $10 or less. That's where you see a big drop. So another aspect of the squeeze is uh, the widespread law-breaking that goes on in the American workplace. Um, I went to law school in addition to journalism school, and perhaps I'm naive, but I, I guess I was always shocked to see that at many of these well-known, great, respected companies, managers often break the law. And I saw this at Walmart and Toys R Us and, and, and Safeway Vons and Albertsons. Uh, and I guess I was astounded at how prevalent uh, it is for companies to break, break the law and how they treat their employees. You know, as many of you know, in, in, in California, a jury a few years ago awarded $172 million 
to 116,000 Walmart workers because the company illegally did not give them the breaks they were deserved. They deserved. Um, I write about uh, workers at Toys R Us and, and Walmart whose managers erase hours from their time cards. I, I uh, interviewed a gentleman named Drew Pooters who spent 17 years in the Air Force. He served in the first Persian Gulf War. He served in Somalia. He comes back to the United States. He gets a job in, in Albuquerque. He's working for Toys R Us, uh, running the uh, electronic electronics department. He's loved by parents because he gives good advice on which are the good video games for your kids and which are the bad video games to avoid. And, and Drew Pooters told me that one day he was in the office checking whether a uh, delivery had arrived and he sees his manager sitting at the computer. And the manager is, you know, moving their mouse around and typing away. And he sees that his manager is racing hours that he and other employees had worked. And apparently, you know, if someone had worked 45 hours a week, the manager only, you know, wanted the worker to just work 40 hours, you know, have, have it say the worker's just going to get paid for 40 hours. And Drew Pooters told me he confronted his manager and said, that's not legal. And the manager turned around and said, I don't want any lip from you. You know, you didn't see that happen, right? And within a week, Drew Pooters was, you know, out of a job looking for another job. And he got a job, his next job was running a small family dollar store. I don't know if you know Family Dollar, they the discount stores, there are 6,000 of them around the nation. So Drew Pooters was told that it's very important at Family Dollar to make sure that you don't spend more than 5% of weekly sales on payroll. So that really entitled him to hire two or three workers to fill up you know, the 100 hour, 120 hour schedule that the store is open. And Drew told me many days he had to work from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, because the company did not give him enough payroll to, to hire workers. And many day, many nights he'd sleep in the store and he had to work so hard that his wife sometimes would say, you know, you're, not, you know, you're leaving work before the kids wake up, you're coming home after the kids go to sleep. And the only way he saw his daughters was that his wife would take the kids to the store around 7 at night so he could see his daughters a bit. So Drew Pooters told me at one point he was, you know, his boss, his regional manager, criticized him and says, you're spending too much on payroll. You're spending slightly more than 5% of, of sales on payroll. I have a way for you to fix this. Go into the computer and erase the hours that your subordinates have been working. And unfortunately, I found that this uh, insidious illegal practice goes on in dozens of companies. And I, I really try to uh, shine a light on this in my book. There are many, I, I could talk at length about many other illegalities. You know, there are violations of, of basic minimum wage law. I mentioned before this Dominican immigrant, Julia Ortiz. She was working uh, for, at this discount store in, Pro in Brooklyn. She worked 11 hours a day, six days a week, 66 hours a week. And for that, she earned just $210 a week, about $3.30 an hour. And, and I... Um, found many workers who were locked in at night. Unfortunately, it's not always illegal to lock workers in at night, as I, as I discovered. You know, Walmart, uh, until I wrote an article a few years ago, would, you know, at many of its stores, would systematically lock in workers. You know, workers do not have the key to go out the door, except there was a fire door. But the workers were told that if you go out the fire door for any, anything but an actual fire, we're going to get rid of you, we're going to fire you. And so I interviewed workers who had broken their ankle, you know, who had a, who, whose uh, wives had called because someone was breaking into their home and they wanted to leave, you know, to, to rush home. And the manager would say, sorry, you can't go out the fire door because there's no fire. Um, safety violations are also quite prevalent. Um, I write about two brothers from Mexico uh, who took jobs in, in Blythewood, South Carolina, digging trenches electrical and, and telecommunication trenches for uh, a new high school. On the first day on the job, the two brothers were crushed to death when the trenches' sandy walls collapsed. One brother was 17 years old, the other was 15. OSHA fined the company $42,000 for these violations. Um, I quoted someone from the Hispanic ministry at a church in, Bly in, in Blythewood, South Carolina, where this happened, and she asked whether the contractor would be as careless or as negligent if these workers had not been Hispanic. And she raised the point that too often managers are willing to treat 
immigrant workers, you know, as, as less, often as lesser beings without affording them the, the, the safety precautions and, and, and other workplace rights that, that are so important. So there's the economic squeeze, there's the squeeze where many companies are just blatantly breaking the law in how they treat their workers. We all know that Enron and WorldCom and, uh, and other companies you know, broke the law in how they treated their investors and they ripped their investors off for lots of money. And I think it's terrible you know, uh, when that happens, but it's one thing to cheat investors who are worth you know, often millions of dollars. But I, I submit it's in many ways worse to be cheating employees who are just making seven or eight or nine dollars an hour and can hardly make ends meet. Our last part of the squeeze uh, I call the squeeze on dignity. And in many ways, American workers are just treated uh, worse. They're treated with less respect, with less dignity than was the case a generation and two generations ago. I think uh, generation, two generations ago, um, companies really tried to make sure workers were happier. They wanted to engender more loyalty in their workforce because they thought that would produce more productive workers. Now it seems, seems you know, with, with job security going out the window, with downsizing become such a fad, companies think workers are highly disposable and they don't think they need to treat their workers as well. And my sense, again, in writing about workplaces uh, in the 50 states of the nation is that there's been this general shift to treat workers worse. I write uh, about a computer engineer uh, in California who took his eight and a half year old daughter to work on Take Your Daughter to Work Day uh, and he was fired right in front of his daughter. Um, I write about a Walmart ca cashier, Verrett Richardson in Kansas City and Verrett told me that the managers at her store were very stingy, very reluctant to give bathroom breaks to the cashiers in the store and she told me that many of the cashiers soiled themselves because they just weren't given a break to go to the bathroom. Um, at Radio Shack's headquarters in Fort Worth a few years ago, the company laid off 400 workers. How did it do that? It did it by email. Imagine getting this type of email saying, the workforce reduction notification is currently in progress. Unfortunately, your position is one that has been eliminated. I'd be shocked. Uh, Circuit City, the late great Circuit City, um, laid off uh, 3,400 3, workers in 2007. It said, we're laying you off because you make more than the market rate. Some of these workers were just making uh, you know, 90 cents more than the market rate. Many of these workers were just making $28,000, $29,000 a year, but Circuit City said that was too much. And some people say one of the reasons Circuit City went out of business was that it kept axing its best, highest paid salespeople because it wanted to bring in people at just, you know, nine, ten, eleven dollars an hour. And to add insult to injury, um, Circuit City told these laid off workers, uh, if you wait 10 weeks, you could reapply for a job and maybe we'll take you back, but only at the lower market rate. I think my grandmother had a word for that, chutzpah. Uh, Northwest Airlines, another company that all of us know, uh, a few years ago it laid off uh, hundreds of pilots, mechanics, and flight attendants, and I guess it thought it was doing them a favor by giving them a booklet about how to make ends meet. The booklet was called uh, 101 Ways to Save Money. Among the tips in the book are borrow a dress for a big night out, shop at auctions or pawn shops for jewelry, and don't be shy about pulling something you like out of the trash. I'm sure those laid off pilots appreciate that advice. As an example of, of, of how uh, companies just treat workers without very basic dignity, I write at length about a woman in upstate New York, um, my home state, called Kathy Samir. And in writing chapters like this, I kept thinking about the golden rules. The golden rule, aren't we told to treat others as the way we want them to treat us? You know, Kathy grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in Syracuse. You know, her mother raised five kids by herself. Kathy dropped out of high school at age 16 to go to work for Catholic Charities to help her mother support the other four kids and get the family off of welfare. 
And uh, after a few years of Catholic charity, Kathy, Kathy moved to some other jobs. And finally, she heard about a new plastics factory just outside Syracuse. And she had heard, if you work hard there, you can move up pretty quickly uh, to become a supervisor. So she took a job at this plastics factory. And her first 13 months at this factory, which made plastic cups for yogurt and cottage cheese and cream cheese, in the first 13 months there, four of the 190 workers had fingers chopped off. You know, their fingers got caught in the injection molding machines or in the printing machines. And a lot of the, a lot of the machines did not have the guarding apparatus that OSHA requires by law. So not only was there a horrible uh, safety situation, but at the factory there's a horrible uh, sexual harassment and sexual discrimination. The, the best jobs on the factory floor were the ones repairing the machines, where you basically sat on your derriere most of the day, and when a machine broke, you got up and fixed it. So 19 of those 20 jobs were held by men. The worst job, and they're really terrible jobs, were basically being a machine tender. So when the thousands of plastic cups come out of the injection molding machine, you go, you know, take them and you put them in a box and you schlep them over to a, the conveyor belt behind you and you risk hurting your back. 93% of those terrible jobs were held by women. And the, the, the better jobs paid 40 or 50%, the men's jobs, you know, the, the uh, technical jobs paid 40, 50% more than, than the uh, machine tending jobs that were held by the women. So Kathy Samir basically said, enough is enough. She told me, I got tired of being treated like dirt. The women there got tired of being treated like dirt. So what did Kathy do? She filed a complaint with the... Um, with OSHA about the safety violations. She filed a complaint with the EEOC about the sexual discrimination. And there's also terrible sexual harassment. I forgot to mention, you know, during the workday, the men would grab the women's butts and their breasts, and they'd ask for blowjobs. And the women would complain to management. And management would just, you know, blow them off and, and take a boys will be boys attitude. So Kathy complained to, um, EOC about all this sexual harassment and discrimination. And Kathy also uh, led a union, uh, union organizing drive at the plant. And most of the workers signed cards saying they wanted a union. So what happens to Kathy? One day she comes into work and management says, there's a police officer waiting to see you. She says, what? And the police officer said, an anti-union worker's car went start this morning. We accuse you of sabotaging her car. And you know, Kathy got very worried. She said, you're out to get me. And you know, it turns out that the car just had a defective uh, sensor uh, light, and that's why the car won't start. A few days later, Kathy, you know, you know Kathy gets off. You know, she's. You know, a few days later, Kathy goes to uh, the factory, and they t tell her, "You have a new job. We're putting you in what was basically solitary confinement. There was a room called hold, where a worker worked all by herself, and the whole the job was just inspecting whether." certain uh, plastic cups and lids were, were salvageable, whether defective ones were salvageable. And clearly they hoped that by putting Kathy in a solitary confinement job, she'd quit because she was the loud mouth, she was the squeaky wheel, and they wanted to get rid of her. They kept her in that job for a few weeks, and she lasted, and she didn't quit, and they moved her back to the, to the factory floor. A few weeks pass, Kathy's called into the human resource director's office and is told, uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, Kathy, but you're being suspended. Two male workers have accused you of uh, sexual harassment. You're accused of pulling down their pants on the factory floor and touching them inappropriately. And, you know, Kathy just, you know, loses it. And then she says, you know, can't do this to me. That didn't happen. You're just setting me up. Uh, long, you know, so a few days later, they say, sorry, you're not just suspended. You're, you're fired. Long story short, after 13 months of litigation, a judge with the National Labor Relations Board, a federal district court judge in, in uh, New York, rules that the company had totally concocted this story to get rid of the one woman at the factory who was really courageous enough to stand up and say enough. So I've talked a lot about the seriousness of the squeeze and, and how the squeeze works in many, many ways. Um, I want to talk a few minutes about what has caused the squeeze. Uh, I have a, uh, a chapter called The Rise and Fall of the Social Contract. And I describe how after World War II, this wonderful social contract was formed in the United States uh, that really helped create 
the world's largest and most prosperous middle class. And in my chapter, I focus on Walter Ruther, the former president of the United Auto Workers, a man about whom Nelson Lichtenstein wrote, wrote a wonderful book from which I borrow heavily, The Most Dangerous Man in Detroit. And what's amazing about Ruther was that he worked hand in hand with once great companies like General, you know, like he worked hand in hand with General Motors and they, they created this amazing series of contracts that guaranteed rapidly rising living standards for auto workers. And because GM was in such a prominent position in the nation, literally thousands of other companies in the nation signed similar contracts that provided, uh, that ensured that companies would do a good job sharing their post-war prosperity with their workers. And there were annual improvement factors that, that rewarded workers for increased productivity. And from 1947 to 1973, productivity for American workers rose by 104 percent and productivity and, and family incomes over that period also rose by 104 percent after inflation. So there was this very nice partnership that as productivity increased, as corporate prosperity increased, prosperity increased for American workers as well. And one of the big problems we face is this decoupling where productivity has continued to march upward, but wages and family incomes have not. So you know, Walter Ruther and, and Charlie Wilson, head of General Motors, again signed these uh, extremely important contracts that uh, thousands of other union companies signed and many non-union companies also uh, implemented, not as contracts, but providing the same thing because they wanted to keep up with the Joneses to be able to hire good workers and they also wanted to keep out unions. So really from 1946, 47, 1950 through the 1970s, there was this era of unprecedented prosperity in the U.S. And one of the main reasons for that prosperity was that companies were more generous in sharing their, their profits and their in increased productivity with their workers. You know, in the 1970s, uh, we really, the nations really started to feel some cracks in that prosperity. There was the oil crisis of 1973. There was the oil crisis of 1979. We had a horrible recession in 1974-75. But I, I submit that the prosperity real, for the typical worker really started to, to um, uh, break down in a serious way during the 1980s. And, and in the 1980s, we saw several uh, important trends at once. One was uh, we really saw much greater competition from imports. I have this wise-ass line in my book saying, in, 1980, in the 1980s, it was the bud crowd that felt the sting of globalization. In this decade, it's the Starbucks crowd that's feeling the sting of globalization. And by that I mean in the 1980s, blue collar workers were really hurt badly by increasing imports of autos and tires and machinery. And now in this decade, it's white collar workers, the Starbucks crowd that's really hurting because so many jobs are moving to India. And for the first time in world history, corporations can move, have the technology to move jobs, white collar jobs overseas, thanks to uh, the internet, thanks to digitization. So uh, according to some uh, studies, American companies are going to move 3.4 million jobs uh, overseas, white collar jobs overseas uh, in the, in, in, you know, during, during this decade. So globalization really started squeezing American workers in the 1980s. You know, we really started to see companies start engage in mass layoffs. And previously in American history, we really didn't see that type of, of, of layoff. We saw companies laying off you know, 10, 20,000 people at a time. Jack Welch, who became the most revered uh, American corporate manager, in his first six years at GE laid off 130,000 workers. And he became the model for corporate America. And Welch did amazing things. He raised the value of GE stock from $13, million, $13 billion when he arrived to $500 billion. So he became the guy that, that corporate America you know, started to imitate. And I think many corporations became much more willing to lay off workers, to downsize workers. Uh, during the 1980s, we also saw uh, labor unions start getting much weaker. In the 1950s, uh, about 35% of American workers belonged to unions. By the 1980s, it was about 20%, and now it's 12.4%, and in the private sector, it's uh, under 8%, just over 7%. So unions have gotten much weaker, and, and uh, I believe that in the 
50s, 60s, 70s, when unions were stronger, they had the leverage to pressure companies to do a better job sharing their profits and, and, and prosperity with their workers. And, and when unions were stronger, they also had the uh, leverage to make sure managers treated workers better. So uh, you had, you know, the social contract really started to fall apart with, uh, because of globalization, because of weaker labor unions. And then there was another big, big uh, factor. Um, the nature of American capitalism changed. I know that sounds profound, but before the 1980s, stock ownership was very individualized, was very atomistic. And if a company you know, did a bad job uh, this year or last year, and its share price fell and it wasn't profitable enough, there, weren't, there wasn't really a shareholder movement. Shareholders didn't band together. Uh, but in the 1980s, with the rise of mutual funds and, and hedge funds uh, and, and pension funds, um, you know, the so-called rise of the institutional investor, when companies did a bad job, when corporate managers did a bad job uh, achieving goals on, on, on profits and on, on share prices, uh, the, inv institutional, the institutional investors would move in and try to get the CEO fired, you know, would try to arrange to have the company taken over. So starting because of these changes on Wall Street, companies became much, much tougher, uh, much more focused on maximizing profits, and that often translated into doing their utmost to minimizing costs. And what was generally the cost that was easiest to reduce? It was labor costs, payroll costs. So I think with this great change in Wall Street, also came, uh, and I think this grew directly out of it, was we saw the increase, you know, the, these waves and waves of downsizing in the late 80s and certainly in the, 1990, in the 1990s. And uh, I think a lot of this downsizing resulted from companies trying to please Wall Street and get their stock price up. So I just wanted to talk for a few more minutes about uh, what might be some solutions to help um, solve the uh, solve the squeeze as i said in my opening remarks i think it's very important for the 787 dollar billion stimulus program to work <laughs> i realize republicans say uh, it's an insanely extravagant socialistic program i realize some liberals say the program's totally inadequate that we've already lost five million five million jobs we may well lost we may well lose two or three million more so a program that the president says will just preserve or create three million jobs might not be enough. We might just be uh, holding our finger in the dike. But let's, let's hope that the stimulus program works. I think we as a nation have to do far more to rebuild our manufacturing base. I really think we took our eye off the ball on manufacturing. I think we were so focused on, on you know, the brilliant wizards of Wall Street and so many of the best and the brightest you know, were rushing for you know, jobs at Goldman Sachs. You know, we're so focused on, on um, you know, the people in Silicon Valley that we forgot about a lot of our basic manufacturing. And I'm glad to see that the Obama administration is trying to uh, rebuild manufacturing and save manufacturing. We're far behind uh, many other countries on green jobs. We're far behind Spain and Germany on wind turbines. We're far behind Israel on electric cars. We're far behind Taiwan on photovoltaic, on solar cells. We, you know, we as a nation, supposedly the technological leader, have fallen far behind in many green areas, and it's good to see the administration trying to do more funding on green jobs and fighting the greenhouse effect, because it will create good jobs and it will be good for the environment as well. Um, we also need to do more in education. You know, far too many Americans you know, do not get a college education. And in this day and age, someone with a college degree earns about 75% more than someone with just a high school degree. And that uh, margin is up from about 40% a generation ago. So it's all the more important than it used to be for, for people to get a college education. In researching the book, one of the statistics that stunned me was that a smart child from a, a household in a bottom fourth income wise, uh, someone who does very well on the SATs from a poor household, has only a 29% chance of getting a bachelor's degree. Yet a dumb kid from a rich household, a poor performer, poor scholastic performer from the top quarter, that kid has a 30% chance of getting a bachelor's degree. So the poor kids are at great disadvantage in just getting a basic bachelor's degree. Another statistic that also startled me is that the nation's 146 top uh, colleges and universities 
only 3% of the students are from the bottom quartile income-wise, and only 10% are from the bottom 50%. So it's, it's, we as a nation have to do a far better job uh, educating uh, the next generation. Uh, I think we also have to do, uh, we also have to fix this terribly broken healthcare system. We, the United States, spend uh, more than $6,000 a year for, on health coverage for every American, on health care for every American. That's more than twice as much as France and Germany spend. That's two and a half times as much as the Japanese spend, yet we have one in six people without health insurance and they have everyone covered. So something is really broken with our health insurance system, health coverage system, and I think we really have to fix it. And I, I, I recommend in my book that we should really move as quickly as possible towards a system of universal health coverage. <clears throat> as I said, I think the retirement security system is also massively broken. I think millions and millions of people in their 50s and 60s are approaching retirement age without nearly enough to, retirement, to retire on. And I think this is a looming crisis that we as a nation have not even begun to face up to. And I think we have to come up with a retirement security plan that offers real security because so, you know, tens of millions of Americans approaching retirement age, you know, face retirement insecurity, not security. You know, in concluding my book, I say another thing that we need is a revalorization of the American worker. And, and revalorize is a, is a uh, pretentious word I learned when I was in France, but it basically means we have to treat workers uh, as if we value them. We have to stop treating them with little dignity. We have to pay more attention to their concerns. We have to be more concerned that we're losing all these manufacturing jobs and all these jobs are moving overseas and that wages <coughs> are not increasing. Uh, I write that it seemed that, you know, earlier this decade that, that you know, uh, Britney Spears and Paris Hilton together got more press coverage than all the 140 million workers of, of the nation combined. And I think we as a nation took our, you know, we just stopped paying attention to workers. You know, we were so focused on, on the billionaires and the Wall Street wizards, we weren't paying attention to how the typical American was doing. So I really think that, if, again, if we as a nation pay more attention, pay more respect to the average worker. Uh, that will in ways subtly pressure companies and managers to make sure that workers are treated better. 